Thank God for the truth. I don't know how many of you were born in it, but I wasn't. And it gives me perhaps insights and perceptions that those who were born in don't have. Thank God for this truth, what it's meant in my life, and that it works. Demonstrations take place in my ministry. God puts his signature on the work. and Men are brought to the cross and changed. This is a time of many questions, and I wasn't asked to come here and answer them. But they are questions. Uh, I would just tell you, beloved, God does not hold you responsible for the light you don't have. Is that clear? Mark Twain once said that people worry about all the things in the Bible they don't understand. He said, it's those things I do understand that worry me. This is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. It's not what you don't know, it's what God has shown you and you reject and refuse that brings condemnation. Please, let's get a different concept of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. Their one work is the salvation of people. They're desperate to save us. God is not a cop or a sheriff who's standing by watching every little move you make to see if he can catch you wrong. We're born wrong. He's not trying to see how many folk he can send to hell. He's trying to see how many he can take to heaven. He loves us, and he's patient with us. Now, you who are parents, you know how you have to be patient with your children. And you are finite. God is infinite. If you know how to be loving and merciful and patient with your children, what about an infinite God? And uh, I'm speaking in generalities because I, I'm not going to take on the questions right here. But, beloved, keep in mind that your faith is supposed to be a pleasure, not a problem. It's supposed to be a blessing to you and not a burden. We're supposed to find happiness. Isn't that what Jesus said in the Beatitudes? Happiness in Christ. And that comes. What is happiness? It's a state of graceful aptitude. A freedom from guilt. Freedom from agitating passions. Freedom from the dread of past transgressions. And when we experience this in Christ, we have peace with him. You know, when this fellow was healed and, and his eyes were open and the Pharisees were trying to create all kinds of questions and problems, and finally the parents said, well, he's grown, ask him. And when they went to him, he, he said, I don't know. And they said, well, what about so and I don't know. What about so and I don't know. You don't know. He said, but this I do know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Experience. I know that he changed my life. I can't answer all these theological conundrums, but this I know. This is the Lord's church, and I'm in it by his grace, and he has changed me. A black Muslim accosted me, and he wanted to argue. Many love to argue. And, and, and my reference is, my authority is the Bible. Well, he rejected that, so I have no answers that he will accept. Finally, I said to him, all right, I tell you what, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you answer it, I'll talk with you. Okay, he said, what's your question? I said, why am I not what I was? If there's nothing to all this that I believe, what changed me? What happened to me? And his mouth flew open. That's the miracle of, of salvation, and somebody has to answer that before I throw it away. It works. The truth works. And you may be as holy as you will to be through Christ and his righteousness without ever being fanatical. Ellen White tells us that fanaticism dishonors the Lord. It makes the truth unattractive. And many who get all hung up and uh, have these problems if you will notice, are unattractive to lost men. They don't win anybody. 
These are, this is not my message. I'm just giving you a few things to think about, and I'm doing it kindly. The folk who are hung up in these things don't win anybody. They take people out. The folk that are bringing in to the fold, the lost sheep, are the folk who are just settled in the faith and love Jesus, and then they go out to see if the gospel works by faith. May God bless you. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And may you be happy in him. And if you've got all kinds of agitating passions and strains and tensions, lean more fully on the bosom of our Lord. The business of experience is so important. What you know, God deals with you that way. He doesn't expect all of you to know what Elder Purdy knows. He judges you not for what Elder Purdy knows, but for what he's imparted to you, what you know. Uh, I have a burden, so I'm going to do this. I want you to use your imagination now, and I'm going to draw a line right here. You see my line? All who see my line, say amen. amen. All right. This line is called perfection. What's it called? Perfection. Now watch this very carefully. This is perfection right here. Now... Here's the pastor. He's not up there yet. He's here. And here I am, right there. And here is the deacon and the local elder. But, way down there is a sinner who just last week gave his heart to the Lord. Long way for perfection. Now, I'm going to quote Ellen White. I, I should have had the quotation here. This is almost verbatim. When it's in the heart to do God's will, and efforts are made in that direction, God accepts this as man's best service and makes up for his deficiency through the merits of Christ. Now, there's a fellow way down there, and here's the pastor almost to perfection. But perfection is here. None of us is there, and yet we are all there. Because God looks at that fellow way down there, and this one here, and this one here, and this one here, and this one here, and he accepts all of them as his children, and their faithfulness as their best service, and then whatever they lack in reaching the line, he makes up for so that that fellow is already there. And the pastor is already there. And you, with your bumbling and fumbling, he takes you right there. Through Christ. His merits. You will never be perfect. You will be reckoned perfect. Through Christ's righteousness. So relax. Don't be apathetic. Relax. And stop worrying all the time about things that aren't that important. And put yourself in the Lord's hands. And remember, he deals with you according to your experience. What you've known, what you've had opportunity to know. What he has revealed and your re reaction to all that. Your willingness to accept by faith his love. I'd better get to today's message. Before I do... Somebody asked the pastor to sing. Well, somebody asked me to sing, too. Amen. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I ought to mention, because some really don't know this, there are two Charles Brookses at the General Conference. One of them is a sweet singer in Israel. I am not he. And I imagine that my brother thought I was the singer. I don't sing. If I could, I would, because I love music. I just have it in me and can't get it out. <laughs> now we go to the message for the morning. God's ambassadors recalled, loose the winds. I read to you from Ezra chapter 1 and verse 2. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, 
The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. There is a clear statement from a king. No ambiguity here. He acknowledges, number one, that I am king of the entire earth because of the grace and providence of the God of heaven. He made me king. Now, whenever we can come to the place we give God the glory, it's all right to acknowledge our gifts and the advantages we enjoy. I told you I just lectured to a group of theologians, or that is theology students, I'm sorry, at one of our colleges. And I pointed out that uh, false humility dishonors God. We've got lots of people who are always talking about what they can't do. There are some things you can do, for God has given to every man a talent. And when we become falsely humble about it, then we don't glorify God with it. It's all right to acknowledge your gifts. As long as you glorify God, as long as you thank God, and as long as you also understand there are lots of gifts you don't have, like uh, singing. See? This king was king of all the earth, and in a clear statement that might reach out to his enemies, he said, the God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. But then there was something else. Remember I told you yesterday, with every privilege comes responsibility. He gave me the kingdoms and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. In chapter 6 and verse 3, the Bible says, In the first year of the reign of Cyrus, he issued a decree, Let the house be builded, and let the foundations be strongly laid. I like people who understand God's will and then get at it. And they do it with a sense of its preeminence. He waited uh, only a little while when he understood God's will. The Bible says in the first year of his reign. He put this first. He didn't wait until he had secured all of his boundaries and built up his own treasury and built a new palace over here and a one for the summer out in the mountains. No, sir. When he got to be king, first order of business was to do God's work. And it ought to be that way with us. And everything else is secondary. The Bible says that we ought not worry about all these temporal things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. So this man decided, I am king now. This is my first year. I'm going to put first things first. So he, he issued a decree that the house should be built and the Foundation strongly laid. And he believed that in doing this, he would not only fulfill the will of God, but bring his kingdom, his fortunes, and his army under the conduct of divine providence. So he moved forward in faith. Now Daniel had been over there all through this period of Babylonian captivity. And Daniel's desire was, to see the prophecies of Jeremiah, his fellow prophet, fulfilled. For Jeremiah had said, 70 years the Jews would be in bondage and couldn't do anything about it. Uh, that is an important sentence. For 70 years they would be in bondage and would have no power to do anything about it. But after 70 years, there was a promise that they could return, be repatriated in their own land, and begin again to evangelize the world for God having built the temple to God's glory. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one reason Babylon had to fall was Babylon had no disposition to repatriate these Jews. They were living by the sweat of their brows and were not going to turn them loose. So Babylon was now standing in the way of God. And on the night of Belshazzar's feast, he simply confirmed his recalcitrance and his intractability by calling for the vessels from the Lord's house and profaning them. Listen, when men get in God's way, he can remove them. When nations stand in God's way, God can humble them. 
Well, you know the story of how the Medes and the Persians marched under the walls of Babylon and overthrew the city and the kingdom that night. The chief of staff, head of the defense department, was a man named Cyrus. Mentioned hundreds of years before he was born. You read that in Isaiah 44, 28 and Isaiah 46, verses 1 and 5. God named him long before he was ever born as the one he would use as a scourge to chastise Babylon and to overthrow this power. Now the 70 years are up. And God tells Cyrus, issue a decree. Let my people go. Let these Jews go home. But do you know what? A rather curious thing took place. These Jews, who were slaves, were now granted their freedom by regal decree. The top man said, you may go. And do you know what? They were reluctant to leave. Now, that's a strange thing. My people were slaves in America. An Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. A bloody battle was fought, and in 1865 it was accomplished. Suppose my people had said, no, 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 we want to be slaves. I would be ashamed rather than proud of my forebears if they'd had an attitude like that. Well, now, try to imagine what it must have been like when the king sticks his neck out and does a strange thing. After all, he had defeated other rulers, and all of them now humbled and subjugated were watching him with critical eye. And yet the top man says to all of these Jews, I'm setting you free. Not only that, but I'm going to give you gold and silver from my own treasure and from the captured booty of war. I'm going to turn over gold and silver to you. I'm going to give you the wealth necessary to rebuild God's house. Now you are free. Go home and do God's work. Now, having expressed and evinced this marvelous magnanimity, the king is rebuffed and repelled and insulted by these Jews who wouldn't leave. And he got upset, and I don't blame him. But before we get into that... Ladies and gentlemen, before we get into that, we've got to find a clue as to why these Jews wouldn't go home. I think I found one in Ezra chapter 2. The Bible says 42,360 did decide to go, and they had, these who were leaving, 43,260, 360, they had 7,357 maids and servants. Slaves had slaves. In other words, these Jews had been over in Babylon, had gotten accustomed to slavery, had found a way to acquire property, were getting along so well they forgot what they were, slaves. And it is so even today. Now, I, I kid you not, and I don't want to be misunderstood, but there are amongst us today some of our people who are living so well and they have so much going for them, and their business is expanding to the extent that they are forgetting where they are. They are forgetting their pilgrim complex. They are thinking of themselves as permanent residents down here, and they don't care whether the Lord comes or not soon. They are living too well. That's why the time of trouble will come. And eventually, in this church, some are going to face the awesome temptation of having to walk out of their doors and leave the freezer stocked and the stereo on the shelf and the color TV in the den and not even lock the door, but take off from there to the mountains to wait on Jesus, having only the promise of bread and water. And a lot of folk are not going to be able to do that. And they're going to switch sides. The problem is, these people have become affluent slaves. But slaves, nevertheless, reluctant to leave. In the day of God's power, they prove unwilling. Prophets and Kings, page 572. Daniel was annoyed with this. 
And immediately Daniel went into prayer. And Daniel fasted for three weeks. Praying and fasting and pleading with God that somehow his people would be moved and that his people would understand the necessity of accepting the freedom God had now granted through his providence. Daniel fasted and prayed. Not only did Daniel become mightily affected by this attitude, but the complacency of the Jews also affected Cyrus. He had been most generous in his plan, and now he is tempted to give it all up. He is annoyed with these Jews, fed up, if you please. I can imagine the king saying, you mean to tell me, I stand before the world to be criticized, I write out your bill of freedom, your emancipation proclamation, I'm giving you of my own wealth and setting you free, and you won't leave? If that's the way you are, forget it. I'm dropping the whole matter. That's another reason Daniel went into fasting and praying. Now, I'm in Daniel chapter 10. In those days, verse 2, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. How many days are in three weeks? Twenty-one. Remember that. Now, while Daniel is praying, and thank God for the power of prayer. While Daniel was praying, God sent an angel, Gabriel. Gabriel. L. There are a lot of names in the Bible that end in L. Samuel, Daniel, Gabriel, Joel. The end of that word is a contraction of Elohim, the name of God. Gabriel means God's angel. God's special angel. There are many times in the Bible where Ellen White says God sent Gabriel, not some underling out there, but his special angel to take care of business on earth. So Gabriel comes down and visits the palace of Cyrus and tries to deal with him to keep him in his generous and magnanimous spirit until God can get the Jews moving. But Cyrus himself has now become recalcitrant and stubborn. And do you know what? Gabriel could not get the job done. I therefore read verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. You see it? Daniel prayed and fasted for three weeks, twenty-one days. Gabriel said, while you were praying, Daniel, God sent me and I was dealing with the mind of Cyrus. But he withstood me one and twenty days. The whole time you were praying, the whole time I was working, this man Cyrus refused to budge. But let me read on. Verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael. There's that E-L again. I was preaching in Egypt and the Coptic church put out some handbills and they accused Adventists of saying that Christ was created. Well, I was amazed at that and I wanted to read their rationale. And when I read down in there, their principal argument was, we say that Michael was Christ and the Bible says Michael was archangel, an angel, therefore he was created and this was their argument. Ladies and gentlemen, that isn't what we say at all. And if we understand the word Michael, we don't have any problem with that. Gabriel means God's angel. Michael means one who is as God. An archangel does not mean he's an angel. Arch means king, monarch, one king. And now let us read the word Michael, archangel. It means one who is as God, who is the ruler of angels. That's Christ. And Ellen White is entirely correct when she says so. Now let's get the picture. Daniel falls on his knees, begins to fast and pray. Immediately, God sends Gabriel. The king refuses to listen to the angel of God. So Michael, Christ, God himself comes down. 
Ellen White tells us in Prophets and Kings that what Gabriel could not do, Christ himself came to do. I'm glad to tell you today that even if a powerful angel in heaven cannot answer your prayers, if he cannot give you protection, if he cannot do what God sees is best for you, Christ himself will still come to our rescue and do what angels cannot do. Let me read on. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came. In your margin it says the chief prince or the number one prince. Michael came to help me and I remained there with the king of Persia. Now I read down in verse 20. Then said he to Daniel, the angel is talking to Daniel. Then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee. Now you understand what's been going on, why I'm here with this explanation. And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a mighty thing to consider. And really the crux of my message this morning. Gabriel said, I was dealing with Cyrus and he refused me. But lo, Michael, the ruler, the leader, one who is as God, that's Christ of the Old Testament, he came. And when he came, Cyrus came into line. Then Michael went back to heaven. I have come to make an explanation to you. And when I leave you, I'm not going back to heaven. I'm going to fight with not against. I am going to fight with the prince of Persia. But when I'm gone forth, when I fly away, when I leave, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. And you who have studied Daniel 2 know that when Medes and the Persians fell, Greece ruled the world. Alexander the Great defeated the last vestige of Median authority at Arbella. And the Greeks rule the world. Gabriel is saying, I am assigned to support Cyrus, to see that he and his kingdom flourish, that they are successful in battle, that they are not defeated, and I will be there until I am called away. I am God's ambassador, and until God calls me home, I will be there to support Cyrus. But when I am called home, destruction and devastation and desolation will come, and Greece will rule the world. I say that is a mighty thing to consider. As long as Persia cooperated with God, really, if you get this, I could close the meeting. As long as Persia cooperated with God, and did not interpose herself and interfere with God's will, as long as Persia did not dishonor God, as long as Persia didn't get in God's way, God blessed Persia, God stood by Persia, but when she turned wholly away from God and gave no further consideration to His will, lo, Greece conquered the Medes and the Persians, and the scepter was passed on to another. Let's look at a bit of history. When the Medes and Persians took over world rulership, Cyrus was not the king. I've already told you he was the leading general. The king was Darius, the man who suffered so on the night that poor Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. But after his death, Cyrus became king of the entire world. The leading general assumed the throne. He was next to rule after Darius, and he ruled for seven years. After that, he was followed by his son, Cambyses, the Ahasuerus of Ezra, chapter 4. He was killed seven and a half years later in Egypt. Then came an Artaxerxes, an imposter known as Smyrtus. He is the fellow that you read about in Ezra chapter 4 who accepted letters from the enemies of Israel and stopped God's work on the temple. Would you like to know how long he lasted? Seven months. When you get in God's way, he can remove you. After he was gone, God raised up two prophets to try to get these Jews moving. 
The decree has been passed. The door is open. They are still lingering. In fact, they lingered so long that Daniel, who had prayed all these years, had to die in captivity without ever getting back home. God then raises up two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. You remember Haggai said to those Jews, you live in your sealed houses in, in bondage. But their houses were sealed, which meant they had the touch of luxury. Haggai said, you live in your sealed houses. You've got money. You've got your carpets, your Persian rugs. You've got all the accoutrements of convenience. You are living here like kings in slavery while God's house lies in waste. Therefore, God's going to blow on your prosperity. and You'll put it in a bag with holes. Don't miss these lessons, beloved. I'm not going to take time to comment on all of them. But let's not miss it. Ellen White says, when we are too busy with houses and lands to give God consideration, God will give us time by removing some of our houses and lands. And he does it for our sake. These prophets began to preach. Then God raised up another Xerxes, a Hasuerus of the book of Esther. An entire book is written about his reign. Now, let me show you something. You remember a fellow by the name of Haman? He came along here. He believed in genocide of the Jews. He didn't like the way the Jews were being treated. All these concessions made to them, already free from slavery, treasure from the king's house, going with them back to Jerusalem. He decided, if I can exert my influence and build a gallus and we can get rid of the whole outfit, the world will be better off. And he got as far as building the gallows. But you know how the fortunes changed when Esther went in under the king. Mordecai was her counselor. She went in and said, if I perish, I perish. God has called me to the kingdom for such a time as this. Well, you might wonder, why did God let the Jews go through this period of fear and anxiety? The Spirit of Prophecy tells us exactly why. Ellen White says... God was trying to make those Jews uncomfortable so they would understand that their stay over there was tenuous and that they would get out of there. God was trying to make them homesick for Jerusalem. And the reason the time of trouble is coming upon the church is the same as that. God is not a sadist. Human nature demands discipline. And therefore, that time of trouble will come to make God's people homesick for heaven so that we'll put the primary work first and everything else will be secondary. So that we will get busy to see to it that men everywhere know the saving truth. That's why God allows affliction and persecution to come on his church for the same reason he let Haman get away with what he did for a while to try to get those Jews unsettled and dislodged and out of Babylon. That's why it's going to come again. Then after this fella passed off, there came another king with a third decree. You know about that, don't you? And his name again was Artaxerxes. He is called in history Artaxerxes Longiminus. And this time God got the people moving under two more preachers, Ezra and Nehemiah. The Persian kingdom had been strong because they had not interfered with God's work. Indeed, they had supported God's work. But after Ezra and Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the temple and its wall... Then the kingdom of the Medes and Persians weakened. They turned away from God, returned to gross heathenism, heathenism and gross insensibility to God's will and the standards of Scripture. And when the Medes and Persians turned away from God, God called His angel home. And when that angel left, Greece, moved in on the stage of action, defeated the Medes and Persians, and the history of this second empire was written and finished. When these angels depart, destruction follows. Haskell said these words, When that nation ceased to help forward the people upon whom God was still bestowing light, it is lost sight of by the divine historian, there is a lesson for us to learn today. I will fight with the Prince of Persia, but when I leave, Greece will rule the world. 
With that historical background, I now want to quickly go to three other entities, and I will not take as much time. The first section was foundational. I invite you now to look at our own country, the United States of America. God had kept this rich and beautiful land hidden during the Dark Ages, when persecution had saturated the soil of Europe with human blood, and when the nations of Europe were intimidated by the Inquisition, and when it seemed the last vestige of the Christian faith would be stamped out by the apostasy, the Bible had prophesied the earth would help the woman and open her mouth and swallow up the flood. And so in 1492, God used a Catholic by the name of Christopher Columbus. His flagship was the Saint Mary or the Santa Maria. And God allowed him to come across the ocean. He didn't even know where he was going. He thought he was headed to India. He didn't know that he was under the providence of God. And in 1492, Christopher Columbus discovered what God already knew. That there was a land here, rich and bountiful. A land here where a new nation could arise. A land here where men could come from all over the world and worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences. And so Ellen White says God founded America and gave her a Protestant and Republican form of government. In the light of recent events, I better pause and tell you Republican does not mean Republican Party. God is not a Republican or a Democrat. God is a beneficent autocrat. It might do well for us to contemplate that. What does it mean then when it says he gave this country a Republican form of government? The word means representative. In other words, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. God did that. We give credit to the patriots. God used them. But God established this nation. And in the words of the patriotic hymn, America, America, God shed His grace on thee and crowned thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Ladies and gentlemen, God has been good to America. The only time this land has been saturated with blood was when God Himself moved to remove the reproach of slavery from our land. Otherwise, No foreign armies have decimated our people. No foreign bombs have incinerated our cities and our women and our children. God has blessed America. The great universities of our land were established first as Christian schools. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and all the others were established as Christian schools. USC down here was a Methodist stronghold. These very schools that were established for the propagation of the Christian faith, you and I know, have now become pits of evolution. Atheism, infidelity, perversion, secularism, and even paganism. On our money are the words, in God we trust. But now we tend to make that very money a God. We have not lived up to the high expectations of heaven, nor even to the high standards of our own creeds. And now there is for our consideration an ominous prophecy concerning our land. It's found in Revelation 13. I don't have time to go into that, except to say that in this country, the image to the beast will be formed. In this country, which God established, God has become laughingstock. Prayer has become illegal. A kind of moral madness is sweeping across this land. During the last presidential campaign, Governor Brown of your state attended a gay rights convention in Washington, D.C. and promised all those people that if he were elected president, they would have his full support. When Mr. Kennedy heard about it, he sent a representative And when Mr. Carter, the born-again Baptist, heard that this was happening, he sent a representative at taxpayer's expense to sing, We Shall Overcome with Homosexuals. Look out, America. Look out, America. We've become a land of pleasure, of permissiveness, of drug addiction, of perversion. We've become a land of corrupt politics, 
of water gates and ab scams, we are turning away from God. Gabriel said, I will fight for you, but when I go forth, look out. Ellen White says, our nation will be humbled. Today, our resources are mostly gone. We used to export tin and copper and silver and gold. Today, we are importing these things for the most part. We are importing oil, and I don't need to talk to you about what that has done to the balance of payments. Our resources are almost gone. But that isn't so serious as this statement from the Spirit of Prophecy, that the Spirit of God is gradually being withdrawn. We will be humbled. And we were humbled recently when a little old nation that was no more than a grasshopper to the awesome might of America held our hostages. And more serious than the 52 imprisoned there was the state of mind that a little country could handle a big country and kick them around. Humbled. All of a sudden, there's a large group that says, we've got to recover past glory. They call themselves the moral majority. Are you listening to me? And they are saying, we are going to affect through politics what God never intended that politics should do. We're going to tell 60 million people how to vote. And we're going to elect certain officials. And we are going to, to, to turn this nation around politically. It cannot be done. Ours is a spiritual problem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the fear that I have with the moral majority is this. Certainly, they have enough to be alarmed about. It's their methodology. This nation does not need politicians with, with moral majority backing. This nation needs to repent and turn back to God and get on its knees and plead with God for forgiveness of her sins. This is what saved Nineveh. My fear is that the moral majority will get beside itself, as they seem to be doing now with some apparent successes, and the next thing will be moral legislation telling you how to worship and on what day. And Ellen White says, when that law is passed, that is the last act in the drama for the... The result will be civil penalties. You'll be arrested for going to church on Saturday. Your pastor will be locked up for preaching the truth. This beautiful church will be padlocked. And many will have to take off then to escape persecution. And the Lord said, when this happens, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Angels will go, and destruction will follow. Now I want to leave the United States and come to the church. And I'm going to be briefer and briefer, I hope. Beloved, God established this church. Why don't you all say amen? And God doesn't do a thing haphazardly. God gave to the pioneers who were not scholars indeed. God gave to the pioneers a system of truth which will last till Jesus comes. The remnant church with a last message. And I don't know what spirit it is, but then again, yes, I do. That causes people to feel that their highest objective in this church is to fight it. Jesus said when the disciples and he were performing and ministering. And the Pharisees said that he cast out devils by Beelzebub. Jesus said, why, even the devil knows that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Why, even the devil wouldn't use me to cast out devils. Jesus said that. And yet there are some who feel that their highest calling now is to turn against leadership and to criticize the church and to undo the pillows. Now, I've dealt with this a little already, and I'm not going into it in depth now, but I want to remind us again that those pillows are not to be tampered with. The Spirit of Prophecy says, Woe unto him who shall move a block or stir a pin of these messages that have made us what we are. Ellen White says, It is as certain we have the truth as that God lives. You want to know why I'm so positive? That's the reason why. I believe in the message. Now, God's people are not what they ought to be. 
And there are some things that have got to be worked out and settled. The shaking time is intended as a crucible refining gold to get rid of the superfluous ones, the disaffected ones, the contentious ones who will not walk by faith. The shaking time is allowed to expunge them and to dislodge them. But while they are leaving, others are coming in by the thousands. The ranks of the Lord will not be diminished. But God is not going to abandon his church. Why must we insist that he dies? I would be terribly uncertain of things and terribly unhappy if I walked around with the conviction that God's going to throw his church away. What's it all about? What kind of madness is this? What makes people think that scholarship supersedes inspiration? What on earth? Causes folk to feel that in order to have the truth, you've you've either got to be a great intellect, a great scholar, or you've got to follow one of those. Haven't you ever read that the Lord chose fishermen, ordinary men, and then endowed them? Somebody said Ellen White doesn't understand Greek and Hebrew. Neither did Peter and James and John. But on the day of Pentecost, they made out all right because the Holy Ghost came upon them and they spoke in other men's tongues and thousands joined the church. And the evidence that God is with the movement is when thousands join the church, not when they leave. Would you say amen? Oh, beloved, where are we in our thinking? And you don't have to be mad at anybody. Some folk think they got to be mad or upset. No. I want everybody saved. I want the lost sheep that are leaving to come back. Further, Pastor, you're just going to have to pardon me. Further, the spirit of prophecy draws a line over here against extremism. All of you who follow me, raise your hand. Thank you. Now, spirit of prophecy draws a line over here against this kind of extremism. Sometimes when you read the Spirit of Prophecy, it almost seems that Ellen White is going against her own counsel. Would you like to know why? When she sees folk over here, she has to say something strong to them to drive them back toward sinner. And then it sounds like she's contradicting what she said over here to keep this crowd from going too far this way. Now watch what I'm showing you. Here is a line against extremism to the right. Here is a line against extremism to the left. But here I am right here. Here's Pastor Purdy right here, and here you are right here. We're not just alike. Say amen. Say something. (laughs) This is important. Pastor Purdy has some ideas that I don't have. It's all right. He's still within the safety zone, for he has not gone to extremes. I'm over here. I'm still within the safety zone. Amen. We are not a monolithic people. There is room in this church for differences as long as we avoid extremes. Don't you think that's important? So I can respect the man who is right here. He ought to respect me right here because we're still within the safety zone. We don't have to be just alike. Therefore, I'm not going to be critical of this man over here because he doesn't do every little thing I do. It would be kind of boring if he were like that. And he shouldn't be real critical of me because I don't do everything he does. The only time we're in trouble is when our convictions and opinions violate principles and we step across the boundaries. There are some things God has made clear. He has made them clear to his church and to his ministry. We ought to pay particular attention to these. They are principles, especially the broad principles of the Ten Commandments. But there are other things he hasn't bothered to make clear. If he had, we'd know the answers. Beyond that, we are into speculation. And that can be dangerous. Now, this wasn't a part of my message this morning, but I'm making it a part. And we've got people speculating today as though they just heard a voice from heaven and they're drawing away disciples after themselves and folk are getting into trouble, not because of principles made clear, but because of the ones... They assume to be the ones that are obscure, and they think they've got the answer. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. We get into dangerous ground. 
I'm a preacher, and I've got some things I'd like to know about. But since I don't have a thus saith the Lord, I allow that your position might be as good as mine. So I'm not going to fight you and call you a hypocrite because you don't see it as I do. we got a question on the nature of Christ. Oh, I wish that I had it all in black and white. I don't. And you don't. The spirit of prophecy hasn't given it to us. The Bible didn't give it to us. Indeed, the Bible said it's a mystery. But this I do know. He was verily God and verily man. You mean you can explain that? The Bible says it's the mystery of godliness. God becoming man is the mystery of godliness. Man trying to become God is the mystery of iniquity. So we have concepts about it, but I don't preach them as doctrine because we don't have the proof. But thus saith the Lord. What I do have is Deuteronomy 29, 29. Secret things belong unto God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. God has given us enough clear truth to keep us busy the rest of our lives without worrying about those things he did not see wise in revealing so explicitly. Say amen, beloved. Because that's the way it is. He just didn't make it that plain. I heard Dr. Rock say this, and I love it. He said, we can't explain it all together. We have our concepts. He said, now, if you try to explain it, you'll lose your mind. But if you don't believe it, you'll lose your soul. Faith doesn't require explanations. Faith simply requires a thus saith the Lord. And faith grabs it and holds on to it. And we are going to be saved by faith. Now I'll get back to my message. The church. Ellen White says it is time for us to return to primitive. Anybody here know what primitive means, especially in this context? It is time to return to primitive godliness. To first things. To the system of godliness delivered unto the apostles and then to the pioneers after the dark ages. Time to get back. Not see how far we can go over here. A time to return to primitive godliness instead of intellectualism, rationalizing, existentializing. And theologizing. We spend our time arguing. And we're not saving anybody. But a man who returns to primitive godliness. By the very witness of his life. Becomes a saver of life unto life to dying men. And I could stand here and tell you experience after experience after experience. How it has happened to me and to others. They don't worry about all these things. But their lives are telling a story. And men and women are coming to the cross because somebody lives the message. Time to return to primitive godliness. Don't, please, look, I'm leaving today and some of you will never see me again. So not for me, for your own sakes. Consider this. Modernism and worldliness are in our church. But let's not go around criticizing all the time. Let's pray for our church. Let's speak a word in due season. Let's live the life ourselves. And I think I might as well tell you this. Don't go throwing away all the hypocrites. Some of them, at the right time, when the pressure is applied, are going to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm going back to the Lord. Don't go throwing them away. Some of the folk you think won't make it will. And some of those you think are ready to sprout wings and grow halos are going to be lost. There was a man over in Ohio who committed a grievous sin and was put out of the church. Now that man had come from an awful background, I happen to know. He had been an awful sinner. And he was in the church for two or three years, taking part in the service. Fell. They put him out. They should have. Within a week, he took his stand and came right back, weeping out his repentance. And they baptized him. And he stayed about three more years, and he fell again. Into adultery. He fell. He did it. They put him out again. Now look, I'm human. I know how I would have felt. And I know how you feel listening to this. They put him out again. 
And the man was so sick of himself, he was so disgusted with himself, that a trap like that could catch him again. And one day he walked in the church, and when the appeal was made, he walked down front. And the pastor kept making the appeal, never recognized him. And when finally nobody else stood, he just closed the meeting. And when the people were going out, he was standing at the altar. Nobody even talked to him. And it got worse. These Adventists I'm talking about, it got worse. They got to the place, they wouldn't call him, wouldn't speak to him, wouldn't shake his hand. He told me, he said, Pastor, I went home one day from work, and I got a pistol out of my drawer and laid it on the foot of the bed. And he said, I sat there, and a voice was telling me to blow my brains out. And he said, I watched that gun, and I watched that telephone. He said, all I wanted was for somebody just to call and say, how you doing? That's all he wanted. Now, keep in mind, he did those things I'm telling you about. But here's where he is now. He said, I knew I loved the Lord. I knew I was a rotten sinner. I knew I had messed up. But I knew I still loved the Lord. And I was praying and asking for forgiveness. I wanted him to forgive me. And he said, I felt that the indication that I was forgiven would be that the church, the saints, would speak to me. Then they called me over to preach in that church. And the crowd was so large, we went to a public high school. It was one of those days where God honors human beings. Heaven came down. At the conclusion of the service, I had to walk off the stage before going out to greet the people. And when I turned to head toward the exits, this man was standing in the wings behind the curtains with his hat in his hand, ashamed to come inside. And a little scared of the saints, too. So he stood behind the curtains. He had slipped in the back door. He didn't even want the church members to see him. And when I turned and started, I was headed straight toward him. And I saw a sight I'll never forget as long as I live. The floor at his feet had a dark spot where his tears had fallen. He had wet the floor. And when I approached him, he was just staring straight ahead, tears streaming. The elders of the church were with me. They were my hosts. I was the guest. So I went straight to him, and I caught him by his shoulders, and I looked into those eyes. I said, man, you love the Lord, don't you? He couldn't speak. He just nodded his head. I threw my arms around him and said, welcome home to Jesus. Well, I guess after I did that, the elders figured they better shake his hand too. The man was baptized. That was 1971. That summer he joined me in evangelism. One of the most faithful workers I ever had. I used him in efforts about six times after that. That summer a young woman joined me in evangelism, a singer. They got married. Today, the two of them are in the organized work as Bible instructors and together have led hundreds to Christ. Don't go throwing people away. You don't know the struggle folks are having. You don't know their hearts. I'm glad that Jesus understands. And as I told one of my sisters this morning, the Spirit of Prophecy says God doesn't judge you by a single incident in your life. He judges you by the general trend of your life. And if that general trend is faithfulness and loving Him and moving up, God judges you as His child, not by every little depression, every little mistake. I'm glad God is not like folks. Time to return to primitive godliness. Time for us to know what we believe. I got a question about 1844. Do I believe that? Yes, sir. Well, why do you believe that? Because it said so in inspiration. That's why I believe it. That's why I believe all I believe. Ellen White says in 1844, Jesus left the holy place, went into the most holy. Don't ask me about a literal sanctuary and all the furnishings and all that. All we got of heaven are glimpses. We don't know what's up there. I have not seen nor ear heard. But I believe. 
Sure, I believe. Now, God is with his church, but where individuals or churches turn away from truth and away from unity and away from harmony and away from the Spirit of God, those angels that have been assigned to protect and defend and aid will take their flight. That's why the Lord Sabbath says, Some have entered dark and slippery places never to return. Did you? This is so serious. Some who are so wrapped up in themselves and so enveloped in intellectual arrogance and so bent on having their way, no matter what the spirit of prophecy says, no matter what the Bible says, some don't, I don't know who they are, some have already entered dark and slippery places and there's no way to save them. I was at Glacier View. I was there. I heard the appeal. I felt the tenderness. And I'm still not judging. Now let me come to the last one, and I did use more time than I planned to. You and I, individually. I talked about the Medes and Persians, the United States, the church. Now you and I, as individuals. We are told that when the image of Christ is perfectly reproduced in us, he will come. And I don't know about you this morning, but I'm humbled all the time by this sense of inadequacy. And then I hear that glimpse of hope that I demonstrated that he makes up for my weaknesses, my inadequacy, through the merits of Jesus. Otherwise, I wouldn't stand. If you knew what I used to do, I couldn't look you in the eye and preach to you. You know why I can look you dead in your eyes and tell you what I tell you? You know why? Not because I've been so wonderful, but because Christ has been. And my sins are under the blood. Therefore, I can lift my head up and look any man in the eye through grace today. Through grace today. But when the image of Christ is perfectly reproduced in me, I've got a long way to go. I feel that all the time. And I think it's better to feel that. When we look at ourselves in the light that flows from Calvary, we will feel our inadequacy. We'll come down off our high horses. And that will make us more tolerant of our brothers and sisters who are not doing so well. It'll make us more loving and more kind and more like Jesus in the church. And that's what this church needs today. We don't need to defend the message. We just need some folk who will live it. And one reason people are losing confidence in it is because so many professors are so far from the standard of the very thing they espouse. What's the answer? Primitive godliness. But thank God his mercy endureth forever. His angels are still with us. His spirit is still with us. His love still o'ershadows us. But when angels leave us, we can go too far. In messages to young people, Ellen White tells of some young folk going to a party, a social affair. And she said, the angels of the Lord went with them. And I like to pause with that with young people and say, I'm glad that the Lord not only goes with me to church and prayer meeting, but he goes with me if I want to play golf. Angels out there on the golf course, Pastor. Angels at the tennis court. Swimming angels. I'm so glad. There have been some times I would have been a goner if an angel hadn't been there. Angels go swimming when I go swimming. Now, don't come asking me if they get in the water. You know, we, I don't know. Uh, they would if they had to come and get me. But she said, these young people were going to a social and angels were going. That's wonderful. But, she said, after a while, they began to play syncopated music. That's the language of her day. I think if she were living today, she would say they began to play rock and roll and disco. And when the music got wrong, she said, the angels departed. My young friends and older friends, you don't want to go anywhere that angels can't go. And you don't want to do anything that will drive your angel away. For when angels leave, we are vulnerable, and the devil, if he could, would move in with a hammer of destruction. 
The Spirit of Prophecy says that when there's love in the home, angels love to dwell there. I can understand that. As a pastor, I have to go to homes that are not getting along well. And, and, and we have to counsel. And sometimes you sit down and the tension is so thick, you feel so uncomfortable, you say, Lord, why couldn't I be somewhere else? You just don't enjoy being in the home when they are cross. They don't even have to talk. They just look at each other. And you know that there are daggers in their eyes. And you feel it. It's communicated. But then you go to a home where love is where the husband loves his wife and the wife loves her husband. And when you're in a home like that, you can understand why angels would enjoy that. Angels love homes where there is love. Now, that's what's said explicitly, but something else is implied, that when our homes are full of turmoil and fighting and arguing and abuse, angels don't like that. And perhaps flee. And that's why many a man does something and he's sorry for it, 20 minutes later, and he didn't know what got into him. I don't know why I did that. Because he has lost the protection of his angel. Let me close now. I've taken so much time. It will appear the church is about to fall. But she will not fall. Spirit of prophecy. I believe it. There will come accusations, and you will examine, and it will appear the accusations are true. And in some cases, they might be true. Bright lights are going out. God forbid. But if you hear that Pastor Brooks has left the church, God forbid. But if you hear that, you hold to God's unchanging hand. If you hear, God forbid, that Elder Purdy has abandoned the faith, you stand on the rock. Purdy is wrong. Brooks is wrong. But the truth will stand forever. Bright lights will go out. Don't follow men. Follow Jesus. We have a responsibility to be an example, yes, but we are human. And if we fail, stand firm in the faith. Hold on to the truth as has been revealed to you. That's all he holds you responsible for. That which he has revealed to you. Don't leave. We must live holy. Right now, the angels are holding the winds. Revelation 7. But eventually, they will be told to loose the winds. These myriads of angels who keep this world from exploding in holocaust. These angels that somehow keep us from accidentally destroying ourselves. Do you all know that in May of last year, three times our computers told us we were under missile attack from Russia? Did you know that? Three times our computers indicated we were being attacked. Now the newspaper said, in the case of such an attack, the leaders in Washington and our military leaders have about three to five minutes to react. In other words, they've got just a little while to get their rockets off. If they don't, we will catch it and Russia will be untouched. Suppose those computers had been believed. You only got three to five minutes. And suppose President Carter had said, push the buttons. And suppose our missiles had gone winging toward Moscow. Nuclear holocaust. We were brought to the very lip of destruction. What kept it from happening? Angels are holding the wind. Why? Till the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Till the work is finished. Till every man who will do right has knowledge of right. Hold the winds. But one day they will be commanded to loose them. And when they do, no president, no premier, no chairman, 
No king, no ayatollah, no man alive can stop the inevitable and worldwide destruction. Our only safety will be in joining Jesus in the clouds above it all. A little boy and his sister were walking one day and they came to a railroad track and they decided to see how long they could walk the rails without teetering off. And so they went along for a long ways. Finally, they came to a tunnel. They knew about this tunnel. They knew that the train went in one end and came out the other. They had seen it many times. They also knew that they had a hole. They had blasted a hole just big enough for the train. There's no room for anybody in there. So they stood at the mouth of the tunnel and debated whether to try to walk through the darkness. Oh, that would be fun, said the little girl. The fellow said, I don't know if we should. Suppose a train comes. And they kept going until they rationalized they could do it. Fun, walking in darkness and in danger. Fun. And so they went into the tunnel. And when they were about halfway through, suddenly panic and terror struck their hearts. They felt the ground tremble. They heard the screaming of an onrushing engine. The railroad was singing its message through the darkness. They turned to run, but running in total darkness was not safe, and they stumbled and fell often. And in a little while, their hearts almost stopped, it seemed, as the cycloptic eye of the train burst through the darkness of the tunnel. It was upon them now. He yelled to his sister to run, but both of them knew they couldn't get out in time. And the walls were cut through the rock just wide enough to let the train through. The lad began to think, this is it. What will mother think? What will mother think? When suddenly the light, the light began to play from one side to the other, closer to them now. And the young man noticed that where the dynamite had done its work, Little concave sections had been carved out of the wall. His eye picked it up when the light came. And he reached back and he grabbed his sister and he slammed her into one of these little depressions. He pushed her in hard. And when he ran away to find himself one, he shouted at the top of his voice to his sister, Stay close to the rock. Stay close to the rock. Church, our only hope today is in staying close to the rock. Ahead of us are severe times, but we need not fear. For even after angels have gone, his promise is, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Your bread and water shall be sure. I will hide you under my wings and cover you. With my feathers, I want to be with God's people then. Don't you? My last opportunity to have prayer with you. And I want you to pray for me. Let's pray for our church. We're in the tunnel now. Stay close to the rock. If you feel this burden with me this morning, and humbly, want to beseech the Lord for power and strength to be kept, I ask you to stand and bow your heads and let us pray together. My dear Lord, I want to thank thee this morning for mercy and grace. We do not deserve the goodness of the Lord. We sin and we fall and we make mistakes. And yet you've told us through inspiration that every noble impulse comes from God. And while we are not much to offer thee this morning, we do realize that in our hearts there is this noble impulse, a desire to be saved a desire to do the Lord's will and to reflect the image of Christ. 
And with that inspiring statement, we realize that this very desire to do right comes from God. So you have not thrown us away. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Amazing is thy grace. It is our only hope. Your righteousness, our only sure defense. Your truth, the only expression of your will. And you've graced this meeting with your presence and granted to all of us these things. And with deep gratitude, we praise thee. Lord, you've allowed me to be here in this little section of the vineyard for a few days, and we've talked together. If I have not told the truth, I pray that you'd block out the things that have been said from the very minds of the people. But on the other hand, Lord, if I have told the truth, and I know I have, if I have not, I'm lost, and I know I've done it in love, and I know I've been sincere, Lord, if it is your will that your people observe these things, then speak to them, and speak to them gently. Bless those who are having problems, and bless those who are disaffected and angry. You told us in your Bible that we were to look diligently, lest the roots of bitterness spring up in us. Deliver us from that, O Lord. If we really believe in righteousness by faith, then help us to realize that a lot of these technicalities that we worry about so much have little to do with faith. Have mercy on your people. And help us to know that there is something beyond the words of men. There is even the word of God and something beyond that. There is this personal work that you do for individuals by speaking to them directly through the Holy Spirit and by holy angels. And while you will never contradict what is already given through inspiration, you will amplify and clarify. And in doing that, we receive new light for our souls. Lord, I'm praying humbly that you'd bless us all this morning. That you'd give us the grace to press together, to love one another, to speak to those who are troubled and discouraged. I pray that you'd help us to comfort the feeble-minded as you told us in your word. That you would make us more like Jesus, who was at home with publicans and sinners as long as he could point them toward salvation. Thank you for the experience I've had. And if good has been done, to God be the glory. And may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I refuse to praise the Lord. And now we are about to take our leave. Lord, watch between us while we're absent one from another. The Lord, watch between me and thee thee and thy house and my house forever. And I pray these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, our conquering King, and for his sake, amen.